all the baddest bitches I know are unemployed right now because their companies are pivoting away from product-led growth. They're pivoting away from freemium. I'm not going to name names because like some of these things have been public and others have not. And also okay. during my interview process, <laughs> during my interview process, I was like looking at companies and I was like, okay, well, like what's the bear case scenario for this product-led team? And they were like, oh yeah, we're going to disband it in a year if it doesn't work out. And I was like, that's not an attitude I want to come in with. So yeah, I was seeing a lot of that. I've been seeing a lot of that in the market. I know folks who've been laid off. I think that people are being short-sighted and they're working towards meeting their quarterly numbers and the amount of investment that they've taken in, as well as the investors that they've taken it from are adding the pressure there. And they're moving away from that product led because it's like planting a garden and waiting for seeds to grow, whereas like otherwise you can just buy that revenue now. Get ready for the Product Tea with Leah, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Leah, and it's time to spill the tea. Top of the morning. Welcome to the Product Tea Show. Today, I'm hosting a very special guest. She is the type of person who thinks API first, even before her morning coffee. And she is so good at her job that when you type growth into Google, it auto-suggests her name. Please put your hands together for the Duchess of Development, the growth guru, the one and only Sam Richards. Sam, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> I'm great, Leah. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. What would you rate this introduction from 1 to 10 in terms of accuracy, epicness, and everything else? I would give it a 10 out of 10. I would also say you do not have to worry about AI ever taking your job. You're a wonderful copywriter. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. So can you introduce yourself to the fools who do not know you? Yeah, I'm Sam Richard. I'm the head of growth at NGROC. I've been there all of six months. Prior to this, I was VP on the growth team at OpenView Venture Partners. And prior to that, I was head of growth at Dispatch Technologies, amongst many other things in my long career. And among, amongst many other things in your career, which one of those was the most fun that you've ever had? Aside from the current job mm -hmm. that you always obviously love the most, of, of course. course. Yeah. Well, so the most fun actually got a question. I spent some time looking for going back into operating or like thinking about my next role after OpenView. And John Itell, who worked in product led sales at Canva, said to me, like, go back and think about the most fun that you had. And it was definitely dispatch. I was like very young, very hungry when I was working there. We were all in the office all the time and we were icing each other all the time and we were thinking and having brainstorms all the time and we were drinking a lot. And it was a really good time. And I miss that a lot. So I'm trying to recreate that at Engra. Okay, that's Minus really cool. Uh, but, by the way, but yeah. I, before we actually met, I was always wondering how to pronounce the Engrok name because yeah. I was like, Engrok? I got it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, now I know. <laughs> now Fantastic. You know. Let, me, let me introduce you back to the audience. I think we don't know each other that well. We had one pre-call, of course, but I think you were actually recommended to me through the LinkedIn feed quite a lot of times. I remember your absolutely illegally gorgeous hair all the time. I'm quite jealous of that one, but also your contrarian takes that seem to be always quite on point. Like you're trying to state something that is obviously <laughs> maybe correct, maybe also like stirring a little bit of controversy, but I really enjoyed your takes in general because they're also coming from a very operational view, no bullshit. And I think that really reflects also where you've been, right? Like you've been on both sides. You've been on the operative side, you've been on the VC side from the funding role and so forth. And I think this whole well-rounded view is very much reflected also in the content that you have. And I really, really like your positioning. So I really liked seeing you now in my feed. And some people also recommended, hey, you need to talk to Sam. She's very, very personable. So here we are. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I feel like I got the majority of my LinkedIn followers by posting absolutely unhinged memes during COVID where I, <laughs> I didn't really do much except think about product-led growth all the time and spend a lot of time on financial Twitter, which is a pretty dark place. On financial Twitter. Okay. That's like yeah. dark places on two dimensions. Of, first of all, on the financial side and then on Twitter. That's uh, okay. Yeah. I can't Twitter look at Twitter. Too. Yeah. No, Twitter doesn't work for me. It's where I go to find my particular brand of humor, which is probably borderline illegal. So, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> so <laughs> what do people then get wrong about you in case they get to know you? So it cannot be the humor then, I guess. No, I actually think people... I've had a lot of folks reach out to me who think, who are like, oh, memes, like this girl is like funny and pithy. And I, I'm not sure I'm like that in person. I, I need to like stew on it a little bit. I think I'm more like the office humor rather than like regular sitcom humor. 
I really enjoy succession, which I think polarizes most people. I think people think I'm more funny than I am. They also probably might think that I'm a better marketer than I am. I was actively, when I was actively looking to go back into operating, I had a lot of like VP marketing offers and that's just not me. I'd much rather be on like the data-driven, more producty side of things, which is why I'm on product today. So is growth the function where you are the closest to product without actually slapping product on the on your job title? Is that what you're doing? Like you want to avoid like the marketing carnage that is <clears throat> happening right now? I try. So at Ngrok, I'm like one of the first go-to-market minds that have been hired outside of like sales. So I keep getting pulled into marketing despite like and there are like nail there are like nail streaks on them on the wall of where I'm trying not to get pulled in. But I do formally sit within product and I'm actually the sitting head of product at Ngrok right now because my boss, who is wonderful, is on parental leave. So I try and sit as close to product as possible, but I actually think that's very rare for heads of growth titles. Oftentimes they sit within marketing. You did it, right? So like after this job, you can actually apply for product roles. It's a very good positioning. Good job, Sam. Welcome to the product world. (laughs) I'm product managing now. I was doing that at Dispatch. However, after having my boss's head of product job for two weeks, I'm not sure that's something I want long term because there's a lot there. Oh, it's all right. If you're you're an executive, it's fine. It kind of works. It's fine. It's not like you have to ship anything. So by the way, I also need to mention that this podcast is not sponsored by Succession. You're now the second person in a row. Like Patrick Campbell also mentioned Succession in his in, in the last episode. So feels right. <laughs> yeah, I want to have a kickback from this. I'm going to, I it don't could know be. who's producing the it show. It could be. Mm. Yeah. Ah, it could be. So just really quickly also from the side of your personal growth, was there someone or something right, that you would consider to be your most important point that actually brought you forward? Like whenever you had a pivot or something, like did someone kick your ass in a specific manner where you're like, yeah, I needed that? Or where did you get your most guidance from? That's fair. I think the majority of my best possible growth experiences happened while I was at Dispatch. And one of my peers who was there, who was kind of running product at the time, his name's Alex Laprod. He's the weirdest guy you're ever going to meet. And he's like, He's doing private equity now in New York and he's very fancy. And he just constantly was incredibly critical of me and the way that I thought and like the frameworks that I was building and made me like go back to first principles thinking. But he also was incredibly supportive of me at the times where I really needed it and was really doubting myself and my moves in life. And I think we all need that person and you never really know who that's going to be in your life. You know when they're there though. Did you also resist the feedback at the start because you were like, no, that's not possible. I'm not that bad <laughs> because that yeah, was, that, was that's like, what it was for me. <laughs> there's this little know-it-all kid who's like my age, and you know, like making all these product specs and working late at night. Like, what does he really know? But yeah, I think we all resist like feedback that way. But I think that it's a sign of growth when we start to accept it. Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting also, like, I don't know when you had your first couple of people that you had to kind of lead as well. I mean, for me, the most difficult part was to really detach that I don't know necessarily better in the areas of expertise that the people have that I lead. I mean, at the start, you can kind of still pretend, right? So like my first, that the first person that I ever managed was an intern, which was, yeah, you know, like he was very, very young and very new. So I kind of got used to like, oh yeah, I know everything better, right? Like, so they always came Mm -hmm. to me for guidance and everything. And that's kind of fine. But like at some point, you just, you start to manage more and more and more and you just don't know. You just don't know. And that was kind of difficult for me also to accept because I took a lot of, you know, the growth mindset, you can also fake it a little bit into some degree, I feel like. I was very good at faking it. And only once I accepted, yes, Leah, your stuff stinks as well. It really started to unlock me for sure. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. And I actually like Leah, now when I'm looking to hire folks, I'm looking to hire folks on my team now. And I look for people who are okay with me not knowing everything. I found that the most difficult management situations where I've been in, where like I need to stand up and be like the optimist for the company, when those people have expected me to know everything and know all the right answers, that's when it's been the most pressure for me. And it's not something that I particularly enjoy either. Yeah, I know that's very true. I think we have the same hiring strategy in this regard. Like just so I can put it also on the podcast, you have no permission to poach any one of my employees, okay? <laughs> <laughs> not gonna not gonna touch yours either so let's just, let's just stay clear from each other can you maybe really quickly go into what ngrok does right now before we go mm-hmm. into more of the product-led growth topics that we are talking about usually on the podcast 
Yeah, I'm happy to. And Grok is a 10-year-old company. We've been around for a long time. Alan Shree was the founder. He was one of the first engineers at Twilio. He's very gifted. But at Twilio, he was finding that it was very difficult to do any sort of testing from his own local device and be able to have a URL where he could share it with other developers or put it online to like connect with a service or something like that. So he created Ngrok and sort of open sourced it, quit Twilio and like backpacked through Europe. And at the same time, Ngrok was really taking off. We have something like five to 6,000 signups per day of developers. And like, if you look at the docs of any very large like developer organization, Ngrok's in there several times. So it's a tool, like a, it was originally a tool that developers used to sort of like share their work and test that it was working online. But we very quickly found in the last couple of years that it's actually a really, really valuable tool to create ingress to anything. So if you have something that's very difficult to get to, something within a customer's firewall, like for example, we have a very, very large customer that handles very sensitive data where they need to get into customers' databases and retrieve it. Mm-hmm. And Grok is their solution for that. Anytime ingress is really difficult into something, and Grok is the is the service that you use. If you think about like POS devices, placing online orders to POS devices, things like that, and Grok is like the most perfect use case there. We also front a lot of things on the internet. So anywhere where you can use Auth0, things like that, you can also use NGROC. Basically, any time you need to get something online programmatically, NGROC is the solution. You know, it's really interesting to me that, I mean, I've been sitting on the product-led growth topic also for quite some time right now. And I feel mm-hmm. like whenever you pick up on something, then you start maybe to pay more attention to it. And then you kind of self-confirms itself, right? But like, this is... By far, not the first time where I've heard that security-related companies or anything that really targets towards developers is now getting a lot of traction in the market when it comes to product-like growth. And it's interesting to me because usually you would say that security, finance, compliance, any of these topics are now really well-suited for product-like growth if you talk about self-serving. Turns mm-hmm. out, actually, that's not necessarily the case. So I've also recorded an episode with Ben Williams from Sneak, which is also kind of It's also very positioned towards developers and so forth. And what is your take on this? Because usually the Mm -hmm. the pushback that I get also on my post is like, yeah, but how do you differentiate between the buyers and the users? Because the developers are not the ones that actually use the credit card in the end. How do you approach this topic in in this regard? At least at NGOC, it's interesting because like, we are just kind of lucky that we sit at this cross, this crossing between security and development. In my experience, developers don't really give a shit about security, except in the way that it either slows down or hinders their cycles. And, you know, that's just a fact. And, but what's really interesting about NGROC is like, you tend to see all of your developers using a singular tool. So ultimately, they are our users. They are not necessarily our buyers unless they're buying like a cheap personal plan. But when we think about going from that individual to going to that team, and Grok natively does that. But when we need to go to an organization, the value proposition changes significantly, and it starts to iterate more towards that sales per- or that that security persona and those IT personas, which are not historically product led buyers. So again, like you talk about the the nature of product led, like. Product-led adoption is great, like in that that user and team scope. But again, going to that organization, security, at least in the developer focus space, becomes really valuable and it tends to be like why you hire sales. So who do you say your organization is designing the product for mainly then? Is it the singular mm-hmm. developers? Is it the teams? Or is it for the security? I mean, <laughs> it's just, I have to pretend to be really naive here. Or are you designing for the buyers who are getting the product mm-hmm. afterwards? For whom do you design, Sam? I think for the first 10 years, Leo, we designed for the developer. And like the reason I joined on Grok is to learn from Alan because in my limited experience like he designs with developers in mind and he designs truly wonderful developer experiences and i want to learn more about that however we haven't necessarily designed a ton of things for security buyers and we just raised a huge round of funding from lightspeed partners and that is part of what we're putting that money to work doing but would you say you're differentiating also for the teams themselves so like is it more of a team tool when you're being onboarded or is it like no you want to get in on the individual user and then you expand to the teams That's probably more what I'm interested in. Yeah, it's certainly like right now, it's an individual user tool. Um, If you think about development cycles as a whole, people go off on test on their own and then they share that link with others. And that is like our virality because that is an NGROC branded link. But we don't currently have a ton of opportunities for folks to collaborate with one another in the product. And that's what we're investing towards. It is really interesting because I see company goals shifting from either 
So what we used to have was either individual user metrics, right? Like, you know, like how many times did you engage with the product? What is the user retention in seven days and so forth? Or on an account level, if you're kind of doing product-led sales, how much is the account overall with the 100 users doing this and that? And it's quite rare that I see team metrics still, mm -hmm. which are actually much more interesting. They also complicate stuff, right? Because in certain products, you can actually be a part of multiple teams with just one account and so forth, but, you know, like workspaces and whatever. But I feel like team metrics is customer success metrics to actually incentivize and structure OKRs is becoming a really, really strong argument, specifically also for these developer companies. Because as you said, maybe the product itself is not very highly collaborative, Mm -hmm. by nature, but almost every tool that we have needs to be shared in some way with someone else, either the output or like, hey, what do you think about this? Like even dashboards from, I don't know, from an analytics tool. I mean, you can collaborate around these as well, as well at the same time. You're not going to create the queries together. I get it. No. But maybe, you mm -hmm. know, like, hey, uh, look at this, right? So like, I mean, whether you take a screenshot and then share it in Slack with your team members or whether you're actually collaborating at the same time with someone, I guess, you know, I think it's a wash in the end. But that's where I definitely see it going. It's going more towards team usage and team success metrics as outcomes. Well, and I mean, think about it. I'm also in the middle of like a complete pricing revamp because our pricing is per user, which obviously inhibits growth within teams. So making it free for all users is is first yeah. step. But if you think about it too, at least in the infrastructure space, like we're somewhat like inhibited by the culture of these infrastructure tools because you don't want everyone on your team having access to production, right? Like you, you want like three guys, maybe they've got the nuclear keys. So you also like part of that becomes policy and you have to make sure that people can see things and then people can see what's going on, but they always have like the security to lock it down so that the, the nuclear keys stay with the nuclear guys. Okay. This is theoretically true, mm -hmm. but in practice, I think in fast growing companies, what also yeah. can happen, and this is, okay, so this is more like a, this is like from, how do you say, like stories from the trenches. Yeah. So we had these internal dashboards, small PDF as well, where mm -hmm. there was always like this big, like, danger zone thing where you could just like delete accounts completely. And that's just accounts, but like, I mean, you could fuck up the entire database, like it's relatively mm -hmm. easy. And who had access? Everybody with an ad small PDF account. Yeah, 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 like everybody in the company. It took us way too long because, you know, like as you're growing, I mean, sure, at the start, you have nothing to defend. Then nobody has time until you have no a security. wants to build internal tools. Yeah. yeah, of course not. Like until the first person is really employed for like making stuff secure, <laughs> probably something bad happens, right? Like you're accidentally that's leaking. My, that's my canary in a coal mine for an organization. Like once that person's hired, I'm, I'm headed out. Like that's not really where I enjoy working at either. <laughs> this is so true. Actually, for me, it's not that person. For me, it's usually the inception of product ops. Really? Um, yeah. Ooh, now, I'm not yeah. against product ops. I'm not against product ops. But as someone that builds organizations around product, I am very specifically intent on delaying product ops as long as I can. And depending on the organization, between the 150 to 500 people, it does happen. It just does. And then Leia is out. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, product ops. Bye, Leia. <laughs> it's like, I'm on. Because then, <laughs> then things become more or too organized, in my opinion. I don't know. I'm not hating on yeah. product apps, by the way, right? So like, just saying. No, 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 no. No, I just like, I want the room to grow. I don't necessarily want like that track job. And that becomes like a track career type place. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So you had a hot take on LinkedIn. I think it was about a week or two ago since this recording. Mm -hmm. And you said with a lot of conviction, you have annoyed a lot of people. I've noticed the number of growth stage companies pivoting away from a product-led approach, which is a blasphemous statement in itself, including laying off teams. Here's what I think is going on behind the scenes. Can you explain to us what you think is going on behind the scenes? And do you still have that opinion? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this is like insider pub, like insider point of view. Like I have had some great friends of mine who are growth practitioners who are looking for jobs or laid off. I, I keep telling all my friends, like all the baddest bitches I know are unemployed right now because their companies are pivoting away from product led growth. They're pivoting away from freemium. I'm not going to name names because like some of these things have been public and others have not. And also okay. during my interview process, <laughs> during my interview process, I was like, 
looking at companies and I was like, okay, well, like, what's the bear case scenario for this product led team? And they were like, oh yeah, we're going to disband it in a year if it doesn't work out. And I was like, that's not an attitude I want to come in with. So yeah, I was seeing a lot of that. I've been seeing a lot of that in the market. I know folks who've been laid off. I think that people are being short-sighted and they're working towards meeting their quarterly numbers and the amount of investment that they've taken in, as well as the investors that they've taken it from are adding the pressure there. And they're moving away from that product led because it's like planting a garden and waiting for seeds to grow. Whereas like, otherwise you can just buy that revenue now with sales. Yeah, I think I agree with this. And it is a bit insidious because at the start, when you do these layoffs, you will not notice a lot on your top line revenue impact, right? Like that's the dangerous thing. You will actually not notice that something bad is happening because, you know, the effects are quite long-term for sure. And the thing that really kills me is, is that I would say I know about two companies, fairly sure. Now I'm not sure from which one it is public, so I shouldn't say any names. So <laughs> let's just not name any names. But like I know from two, at least very much like very public companies that they were not for that long in this product led growth motion. So like below 10, two years, for sure, like two mm -hmm. years, less than two years. And one of the problems is, is when you're trying to also have a classical sales led business and you're going into the product led growth motion, right? Like you try to make product led sales work and so forth. It takes time to acquire your first customers from the down segment. And then it takes time to actually for those to expand. If you do not have any reporting for this, you just look at the revenue, then you're like, yeah, well, okay, from the lower segment, we're not getting that much revenue. And then therefore we're just mm -hmm. cutting it off. I think in many aspects, it's also a reporting problem in that expansion revenue is just not that sexy in PL statements. And this is also something that I find quite interesting for all public companies. The way that we report revenue is you cannot infer how good a company is doing if they are product led. Everything has been structured around sales led companies. You just, you cannot infer ARR from a revenue statement of a classical company. It's just not possible. So you only know how good that they actually do on their sales led motion. And that, that is quite mm -hmm. weird to me still, because we're still not, this will never change, right? So public data is just not for recurring revenue. Not rate. for PLG. Well, no. my friend Sean Fanning, who's at OpenView, he's a VP at OpenView, and he was like, who brought me in there? And I worked with him at Dispatch. He actually reviewed, I think, like something like five to 50 companies S1s and found that they all had different calculations of net dollar retention. So, like, there's no standard. So, we can't imagine, like, I can't imagine that there's any, like, there's nothing going on behind the scenes that helps us understand that. So, I'm always looking for the next thing to actually crap on. So <laughs> I was historically always crapping on NPS for the same reason. There's really no standardized way of measuring it. So you cannot compare mm -hmm. it, but it is one, it was one number for your business, right? Like you don't have, you don't have NPS for multiple products or maybe you do, I don't know, whatever, but it's not very actionable. But the problem with NRR or like net, net dollar retention is exactly the same thing. If it's mm -hmm. not standardized, how do you want to compare it? But still, it is still an incredibly important function to analyze how well that your business is actually doing because we're always talking about yeah you don't want to have bad revenue right so like the short-term revenue and so forth but the first moment that you see someone almost pulling the trigger on three hundred thousand, and you start to make concessions you nuked it right mm -hmm. but you're going to be actually celebrated by everyone and like look at look at this big contract that we got in and that's going to just cost you so much more money i don't know yeah but maybe net dollar retention is the next thing that i'm going to crap on Maybe we should just crap on like the one number thing. Like how simplistic do you need to be to think that there's going to be one number that rules your entire business? Like I feel this way about rule of 40 as well. Like you think there's going to be one number that helps you value an entire business with hundreds of people in it? Awesome. Like who do you think you are? Yeah, you know what? We're going to, we're going to try to outperform Elena with her cat hate because that's what she did. And then since like, since that entire LinkedIn started to follow her, I'm like, oh yeah, CAC is the worst thing. We've never heard about this before. I think we can frame it around that it is different enough from net dollar retention. Well, we can make mm -hmm. this work. That's good. Okay, that's cool. Okay, so I think this is a very interesting discussion in general on what's going on, but I think also because this is so hidden. So first of all, the metrics are not good and then they're not public, so they're not standardized as well. This is still... I'm extremely surprised still how many companies are still operating in a non-product-led growth way. I mean, you don't have to put the name on it. It's just that in many, many ways, 
a lot of the sales companies that I see, they don't know how to do proper product management because its product is kind of serving just like as a function to fulfill a customer request from sales. And it kind of works, right? They're still alive. And mm -hmm. They're still working. It's still kind of okay. But it does surprise me when you step outside of the bubble, you know, that I have so carefully created in on LinkedIn, how many companies have never done anything like this. So oftentimes when I was starting to consult, I was very, very afraid that I could not deliver enough value for these companies, right? Like I was deathly afraid. I'm like, yeah, but what I'm saying is so basic because I'm talking about it every day. Turns out for some of these companies, you have to explain them what OKRs are, just like as a principle. And well, whether you should do that or not is a different question, but like, you know, that can also happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even like, I don't know, I love using KPIs as like a way to get teams to do what you want them to do around the business. And that like being able to design a good KPI that people can't work around or like doesn't serve the business is like more of an art form than anything. So like, I don't know, people are saying like, this is the end of tech. This is the end of like these product led careers. And I absolutely disagree with that. Like you cannot offshore those things. You cannot outsource those things. Those are things that like have to be nuanced to the particular business and they have yeah. to have someone who's deep within them understanding it. And that's kind of like, I think consultants are really great for some things. And I have a lot of really wonderful friends who've opened their own consultancies, but like, it's always been my desire to be super close to the product and to the user so that I can like design these experiences and businesses around them. I think if you're really good at designing mm -hmm. an escape room, then you're really good at designing KPIs because what are we doing normally when we're not good at defining outcome-driven goals? Because this is hard, right? Like you have to actually sit down. You have to be really sure about your product strategy. Even if the sun is shining outside, you want to go with your family to the beach. It's always easy to say like, okay, for this team, you know, like for the next three months, they're just going to deliver a feature instead of something outcome-driven that actually mm -hmm. makes sense for the business. But really to sit down and say like, look, actually, I don't care how much you guys work. As long as you fulfill this goal, I am super happy because I, the, the company will be well off, that is quite hard. That is quite difficult. And my theory is, is that if you cannot do this, then you resort to other very, very efficient matters like measuring the time that people are attending in the office or <laughs> other garbage, you know, like on how to control people's output, which just does not work in the longer term. So I 100% I agree. And I think incentivization also towards sales, by the way, is incredibly powerful incredibly powerful, but you need to get it right. And you should just like make sure that your goals are actually for the customers and not just for your own balance sheet. Of course. Yeah. LinkedIn no. is all about pricing and packaging being like the number one lever of growth. And I don't disagree with that. However, I think one of the most like over like overlooked topics is sales compensation and the way to design yeah. sales compensation packages, because that's going to make or break your business. Yeah. This is one of the first things that I say in every consultancy call. If we do not get your sales incentivization correct, then what's going to happen is, is that sales are going to grab your leads before we can qualify them properly. And then everybody's going around. Gary is just going to run around in the company and says like, oh, look, product led sales, it doesn't work. And that's why I usually have this approach where I just like, okay, get everything ready in the background. Adjust the sales compensation. I want them to come to us to ask, okay, so you want us to do what was the customers? They have to be successful. How am I supposed to know? And then I'm like, glad you're asking, mm -hmm. Gary. Here's the data, right? We're ready for you. And that's the kind of thing where I feel like, yeah, a lot of things are actually going wrong. So if we have some other hot takes in regards to uncomfortable truths in tech mm -hmm. that you feel like that nobody wants to hear right now, would you have a couple of those? Yeah, I do, especially in tech. I think like people are afraid and I think maybe the worst is over, but who knows? Cause like we're running into some political situations in the U S that should be horrific. But I think now is not really the time to be at a big company. I feel like the last 10 years or so have made tech employees think like everything's just going to keep going up. And people were making millions of dollars as like individual contributors or like leadership at like companies like Twilio at companies like Datadog, et cetera, just because the stock kept going up and to the right. And I think that that makes people think certain things are true of themselves when that's not necessarily true. They just happen to ride a really good time in the market. Well, you know, I was not one of those people who got aboard one of those rocket ships. So I think maybe it's unfair for me to say this, but I think now is the time, especially if you want to grow and especially if you want to stretch yourself to not be at a big company and to be at one of these smaller scale up companies. And I think like 
especially given my time at OpenView in the last couple of years, I didn't see a ton of SaaS that was wildly interesting. I saw like a lot of point solutions. I wasn't seeing things that would necessarily be the next round of IPOs. And I think like now is the time that people are going to be building interesting companies. And I would like tend to stay away from the companies that have been founded in the last five years or so. That is a very interesting take. And I think I agree, but from a different side, I think also mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's it's not the time to be at the big company. First of all, not just because of the compensations are coming down now, right? So like even Google is now, they're correcting hard, like they have all the mm-hmm. layoffs and everything. And But I think it's very, very interesting that overall the size of a company, I believe is going to shrink down in average hard simply because I need to know still as a head of product that I am right now, I still need to know how to ship products. I need to be very, very close to the customers. Mm -hmm. And there is a theory around all of this kind of AI automation that is just getting rid of a lot of the stuff that is actually overhead or like grunt work done by the base. That if you just take this away from companies and you just leave what's necessary to create a good product or like a niche solution and also pivot fast because right now our markets are changing relatively fast. You don't Mm -hmm. need to have a big team. Most companies, like we are fully staffed at 24 people right now. Mm -hmm. I don't see right now why I would need more people unless we would go into hard scaling mode, of course, you know, like, and you actually scale the distribution. But I have no use for like five or six product teams. I just don't. And that seems to me quite interesting in this regard, because I think I'm totally agreeing with you. I think it's just from a different perspective, but yeah, the Mm -hmm. time is over to be at these big fan companies. I totally agree. Yeah. And I mean, that went back to like one of the core pillars when I was looking for my next operating role was like, I just want to work with really smart people. And I find that that is also easier at smaller organizations. Yeah, that was the same for me. I went from 150 back to 20. It's exactly the size size Mm -hmm. that I really, really love. Mm -hmm. Um, And no product ops. No product ops. Absolutely no product ops. Sorry, product ops. No security officer either. (laughs) Okay, so what else do we not want to hear right now? I have noticed a lot of folks like starting out consulting and those types of things. And I think that's great if it works for you, but I don't necessarily think it works for everyone. I go back and look at some of the things that I wrote at OpenView. And like, yes, I agree with you that there are some things that people need to hear, especially at larger companies. Like they need to know what an OKR is. They need to know what product-led growth is, those types of things. But I laugh now thinking about the things that I presented to product teams and founders because they were just so high level. And like sometimes receiving that feedback now sitting where I said, it's like, no shit, I need to be doing that. But there's like 10,000 things under the surface that have to move yeah. first, unless yeah. I want to absolutely burn all my social capital here. So I have like that person sitting on my shoulder, the person I used to be, that's like, ship this now. Like, why aren't you doing this? But then I have this like leadership role that I need to have and I need to like come back to work tomorrow and have people like me. So I'm trying to balance those things. <laughs> So do you think, so is your argument that consulting is not for you to co- like to have a consultant with you because they don't know what's going on? Or is it about you being a consultant as well for other companies? It's both. I just think like consulting at a high level, it works. But when you are really in the trenches at a company, you probably need to learn those things, those high level things. And I'm like lucky enough where I have learned those things. I spent three years learning those things. But there's always tech debt. There's always people debt. There's always product debt that you have to work yeah. around. And that is highly contextual. And that's not something you can get as a consultant or that you can give to a consultant. Yeah, I find this very interesting because for me, it's, I still have, so I have a full-time role as a head of product and then also two retainer contracts usually running on the side. And it's very interesting how they feed off on each other because my full-time role keeps me really grounded because I have exactly these problems, right? Like the drama that just does not stop. Like, yeah, well, we've talked about this 15 times already. (laughs) Let's align again Mm -hmm. on it. And a lot of the operative roles that we have, and I would say that I know my well well around product-led roles, hopefully, if I position myself in this way. But the thing is, very, very, more often than not, it is about simplifying something that we already talked about 20 times because someone in the room did not miss, did not understand it or was doing something else, I don't know, whatever, or just misunderstands. Misalignment and communication on the most basic level of strategy or whatever you do in your product is probably the most common thing that I'm dealing with in my operational role. I don't mind it. I love it. I really do. 
but as a consultant to not have this kind of perspective makes you also kind of lift off, right? And then become right. a little bit arrogant towards the industry because it's just like, yeah, but like, why are you talking about it? But I do concede though, you should ship more often than you actually think, right? Like always center yourself. Okay, you know what? Like I'm dealing with too much shit right now. Let's let's just cut off a lot of the stuff and just put something out if we can. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I agree. I absolutely agree. I also just think like it's really valuable like for you to have this retainer because you need to just get more reps in. Um, sometimes I think companies can be echo chambers and that's also really not great. Yeah, that's true. And it generates also a uh, content, you know, for all sides, everything that I write up as content, I can bring into the company and the other way around. So like, it's becoming mm-hmm. like this perpetuum machine. And then people are asking mm-hmm. like, how do you do that all day? And I'm just like, I'm a recycling machine, man. I'm yeah. Doing anything yeah. Else. <laughs> that was, that was what was so glorious about the roll it up with me too. Was Cause I was like, I had a ton of reps in, I was seeing all these different companies problems and then no. boom, you have a blog post. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's on my bucket list to, to work on the side of a of some kind of fund because then you get exposed to a lot of different companies in a fast way. Still a little bit also on the operative level. So it's not just like from yeah. the outside very much. So that was really cool. Was there a point in your professional life as well, or maybe still have? Like, so what are do you still have remaining insecurities or are you like totally clear with yourself and everything is fine when mm-hmm. we talk about where you are right now, like considering that, yeah, you made it right. Like you have a good job. Can you I, seem to be I? happy with what you do. <laughs> no, I don't know. But like, this is the thing where I'm like, people are starting to kind of, I don't know. I, five years ago, I had in my growth plan that I want to have an executive role and mm-hmm. then you get it and you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, it's such a stupid goal. Um, I know. Are you dealing with any yeah. of this? I had that. I met the goal and I was just like, now what? Like I was less enthused than I thought I would be. I don't know. I feel like a lot of women my age and older are struggling with that question that I talk to. Maybe it's all men too, but I don't tend to talk to men about their careers as much. And I agree with you. I don't really know what the answer is. I want to, I have this background as an athlete and who's like always been a doer on the team and who's always been the one that you turn to to ship and get things done. But I know that that changes and you need to have this executive presence and you have to be an executive and like you have to really focus and do less so that you can achieve more. That is what bothers me more now because A, I'm at a very early stage startup. B, I'm like taking on a lot of roles because we're trying to fill a lot of spots. But see, I have two toddlers at home. So I can't do it all. Like I also have to like be present and around in their lives. So trying to figure out how to juggle that elegantly so that I can a like make that jump and not always be seen as that athlete. Um, but also can be seen as that sort of executive and hopefully like an eventual board member or C level, but B also to just live a good, uh, a good and fulfilling life as well. Um, so I'm not sure those are insecurities, but there's something that I'm always carrying with me and I just never feel like I'm doing enough on either front. This is so fascinating because I think in many aspects, we kind of always look forward, right? Specifically also when we're younger. Now I feel like I'm on the edge of like, okay, maybe now I'm getting actually grown up where you just like, you spend so much time of your day with your job, even Mm -hmm. if you work remote, right? Like it's still the same thing. You're in meetings all the time, your head is there, whatever, like the majority of the time, you probably spend more time at your job than you do with your main partner. And it's fascinating. And I think the biggest relief for me, and I have plenty of insecurities, right? Like I have plenty of them, but it was worse five years ago. But I think the biggest antidote that I had for insecurities was to actually get control over my calendar. Mm. It took me so long to get control over my calendar because I remember this, there was this material from Reforge about product leadership or something Mm. where they had this kind of common mistakes that people do once they go into leadership roles. And one of them was, is that you start to work more and more and more because you think with more responsibilities, you also have to compensate more with your own time, but that does not work anymore. And the moment you stop doing this, your productivity also stops. And the Mm -hmm. only way to actually get this under control is to say like, look, these are all the things that I cannot do. And this list gets much, much, much longer. So saying no becomes more and more and more important. And I felt like this is a really good antidote to a lot of the insecurities that I also had. I just not apologizing anymore. I put my stuff into my calendar. Everything is time boxed and I don't give reasons. Mm -hmm. And this was so difficult for me because I always justify myself to everyone all the time. Hey, I cannot come to this meeting then because, you know, like, (laughs) usually it's why (laughs) and what I did for prioritizing and everything. And it was just the worst, the worst experience. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I, I've been lucky enough to like have things to look back on for that. I remember like, so when I left dispatch, I was seven months pregnant with my oldest child and I started open view. So like there was definitely a time box. Like there were some months that I needed to cover in order to like make sure I was doing well in my new role. Like I had been a dispatch since day one. I was like, you know, very close to the founders, like very much on the early team. Like we took it from zero to 10 million and then sold it to private equity. And I felt like I needed to give them all this time while I was leaving. And then I like made all these documents and things like that. And like, guess what? I left one day and the company went on without me and no one looked at those documents, by the way. And like, I think about that a lot. It's just like, just because you think that something will go on without you doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And that's sort of like what anchors me frequently when I'm having these thoughts in my head. No. Are you feeling under a lot of pressure because you know how many people are dependent on you despite? So like, even if you say that not everything revolves around you, still a lot of actually does revolve around you. Do you still struggle with this right now or is it? Totally. Especially around company culture. So like we've gone at Engrock from this like company of developers for developers to a company that is like a little bit more commercially oriented and that can have major impacts on culture. So I'm trying to like completely over communicate and I... I have made so many slide decks in the past couple of weeks to like over communicate this transition to the company and to like have check-ins and make sure everyone's feeling all right and those types of things. And there's that. And then there's the fact that I have to travel like once a month and be away from my children. And that has like major repercussions. They do not like me to leave the room anymore. So again, like, yeah, you're serving all of these masters. But again, I mean, at the end of the day, like dispatch survived without me. Any company would. I have an incredible amount of respect for moms. Like I don't have I don't have children, but I know already how much work that a job like this is. And then you have also children on top of it. It is massive, but it's truly, truly inspiring. Yeah, you have a really good spouse. Adam Fishman wrote an article recently that basically said that you couldn't do this with kids, and I found that to be very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam, are you listening? Because Adam was also on my podcast. He's actually wrong about this. I'm going to write him right now afterwards. Like I will tell him. I will definitely tell him. Yeah, but like, that was Adam, a huge doubter. I wish I hadn't read that. No, I think you can. I actually think you can. I think one of the things that... And so, again, I speak from the perspective of not a mom, right? Like I don't have children in my life. But I think it's not just about so much about how much time did you have in your day to do something. It's also about how much context did you need to switch because you're working on something, you're in deep work, and then, I don't know, you get distracted by something else, whether it's a child or a different client or a different problem or like, I don't know, the dog just like started to, I don't know, eat the front door. Okay, that was not a very good example, but you get what I mean, right? Like you're you're being constantly like context switching. I think like context switching is probably the thing that costs you the most time. Where I think with children, this is especially hard from what I hear from my friends, right? Because there's just, there's no like, okay, child, I will take care of you in three hours for two hours. It's just not happening, right? Especially if you're home, that just doesn't seem to work. So I feel like this is also quite difficult. But it applies to children as well. I mean, I'd make sure that I spend an hour with them a day, no phone, focus on them. And that's helped a lot. And I mean, I think that can be said for work too. Oh, that's why I never reach you at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> good. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So maybe also in regards to your content, because we're close to nearing the end, but what is your favorite topics right now that you're talking about, that you're writing about? Like, what do you focus on mm-hmm. except for trashing that's revenue retention? I'm thinking really critically about developers and just like growing developers, especially when you don't have things like a dashboard, when you don't necessarily have a product that you can touch and feel. And A, like what are the pros of that? Like one of my favorite things and why I started at Ungrok is because they do have really good net revenue retention. You know, when people start to build that into their product, it's really hard to take it out because you have to change code, et cetera. So it's like mm-hmm. beautiful once it's in. But how do you sell the value proposition when you're when someone's just using the CLI? and they're just using your APIs, like how do you even sell them the value? How do you get them to adopt it? How do you get them to understand new things? Especially like I work with developers every day, Leah, like they don't read. They like, if I tell them something specifically to their face, the chances that they remember it is like 50%. So like, yes, they're, they're struggling with context switching too. And like, how do I make this a respectful experience for them while also balancing my need to grow the company? No. 
And is this uh, so? Like, wait, was so you said they retained fifty percent? Is that a yeah. high number or is that a low number? Now I'm really confused. Well, that's fair. You know, I've worked with certain other segments of the population that have like goldfish memories, but I'm always surprised because I'll have like a one-on-one with folks and I'll tell them something and then they'll ask me about it a day later. So, um, so there's that. But like as a population, I want to stay very close to developers. I think that's like where product led will always stay. And I also think it's yeah. kind of like the nature of OG project product led is open source and understanding those yeah. models and figuring out how can I apply them to newer functions like an API first company. Okay. No, that's really interesting. And I think I can agree with this without giving too much pushback. So let's just now segue into the last topic then. So if you have to make a prediction on what is going to happen in the market, like in terms of what trends are coming, what are you betting on in this regard? The software market or like macro markets? What are we thinking? Whatever you want. You can also go into the 50% attention market from developers. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I agree that like, I personally am placing my chips on this like low attention market. I think like work from home is going to be a thing. And I do think that it actually really impacts our attention spans negatively. And that's why I'm like putting all of my time into API first companies and companies that once you integrate that tool in, you don't need to drive usage like moving forward. Like I think that's why we saw so many tools, especially in the last year or two, asking us to build Chrome extensions and, you know, add notifications and things like that. Everyone is vying for our attention. I want to work for and look for companies to be successful that don't need our attention, that are set it and forget it. And then you pay for what you use. No. It is quite interesting though, because API first businesses Mm -hmm. are inherently difficult to track specifically, so right? So like the product mm-hmm. is extremely hard, like because we have the same problem. We're, we're delivering mm-hmm. weather forecasts through an API. And if you love the weather forecast in Belgium at 12 o'clock, you're not going to pull it three times. It's just like there's no. no engagement metrics to go with. But still, you, you can actually build it up as a product-led growth business still in, in this regard. And uh, yeah, that's a good take. I'm going to take yeah. that. That sounds really good. Yeah. You have fewer interfaces and things like that to toy with, but it just means that you what you have put out has to be very high quality. Okay, cool. Yeah. So then the last question, if you could travel back in time 10 years, where would you have gone? Like which company would you have joined? Uh, I would think any of those companies that IPO'd between 2017 and 2020 that is making that those, is such you know, a cheap answer. millionaires. <laughs> That is so cheap. I'm working, you're working, like it would be nice to not have to work. But I mean, ultimately, I think I've learned even from a distance from people over at Stripe and Ramp and like in those fintechs. But again, like any SaaS company that went public during those years would be just fine with me. Okay, so how close did you get to being really rich? Like, how close did you get? Like, how um, close? Because I was really close. Yeah. No, it's not happening yet. <laughs> really rich is also relative. Dispatch had a nice exit. I bought a house off that. But oh, outside nice. of that, not very close. VC is like a very like tops down model. Yeah. Like you can make a lot of money in VC if you're like a partner and you're very good. But you know what? I placed my bets on NGROC and I think we're going to do wonderful things. Cool. Okay. Then I will see you again once you're a billionaire after NGROC. And yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. (laughs) Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much for listening to The Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtarin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 